Hey everyone, I'm here with Paul again. He's going to give us a tour of the lumber side of his business. If you didn't catch the previous video where he showed us kind of the wood shop aspect of things out here, definitely check that out. Paul, real quick, who the heck are you for whoever didn't see the other video? All right, if you don't know who I am and you haven't seen the other video, I'm Paul. My main feed is uh, at Canadian Woodworks on Instagram, but uh, I also have a second company on there, a second feed uh, at Legacy Lumber. There she is right there. And basically what we do is we collect uh, city salvage logs. So they're already being cut down either from old age, uh, storm damage, or around me it's a lot of development. So a lot of houses are being built, so the trees are coming down. I'm very fortunate to work with a lot of different tree service companies that bring the logs to me. We then sawmill them, uh, we dry them, and we either build furniture out of the lumber or we sell the lumber. So this is how the process starts. We get locally salvaged logs, uh, again, typically cut down by local tree service companies from development, old age, uh, or disease, that type of thing. And I'm very fortunate to be able to get this type of material, sawmill it into lumber, uh, dry it and sell it, or build, build furniture with it. Um, this was my first sawmill, and uh, I'm 35 now. When I was in high school, my brother was already into logging, and uh, he had a partner in his company that had literally this exact same sawmill, but no hydraulics. So this one has a hydraulic clamp that moves in and out. It's got a fancy turner that turns the log. This thing lifts the log. Uh, so this cool hydraulics. When I was in high school, I was the hydraulics. So uh, a lot of people, when I start talking about wood, they, they say, hey, you know so much about it. And one of the reasons was I was fortunate to, uh, to spend a lot of time with my brother's partner who was already in the lumber industry you know, for 20, 25 years, sawmilled. You know, he's been sawmilling longer than I was even born. Um, and I really paid attention, asked them a lot of questions, and I learned a lot. So I learned about, you know, how to roll logs, how to move logs around, how to move lumber around without, uh, without hurting yourself. If you follow Matt, he's obviously learned how to move lumber around also, because you see him with his chain hoist and all, uh, all sorts of things. I think it was a van at one point or whatever, your truck moving. Yeah, 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 the trailer and the truck. The trailer, the truck, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I do love, I wish I had a, a, the A-frame trailer. Oh, yeah. It's nice. That's slick because there's logs that I could have gotten with that, but we haven't been able to get like other ways. Yeah. So it's a neat little tool to have, that's for sure. Um, so I was very fortunate to have my brother's partner who literally had the same sawmill. I learned from him. Um, I always dreamed about having my own sawmill to cut my own lumber to make my furniture. But I always thought, oh, too expensive, yada, yada, yada. As I was mentioning the mat earlier, I seem to find deals. I got a smoking great deal on this. It's an older machine. It's from 1992. Um, but uh, those machines were actually simpler than the newer machines. And um, everything's pretty simple to replace. Woodmiser, I think one of the best companies I've ever dealt with. They have parts, they literally probably have every part for this machine in stock within two days. It's pretty amazing. In Canada, like I understand in the US, like much bigger uh, population and more of these running around. But even in Canada, they're like stocking all these parts, which is fantastic. Um, I slightly modified it. No, yeah. <laughs> also on my YouTube channel, I have a video about uh, literally cutting my sawmill in half. So this is a bandsaw, and what Woodmiser is famous for is that it's cantilevered off the one side. So on this side, there's nothing. The entire bandsaw hangs off this side. So my ingenious thinking was, let's cut it in half and um, actually put an insert. This is a piece of aluminum I had machined to fit inside this tube. And uh, I, can, I can slide this back to stock length or I can pull it out and I can actually now cut up to about 42 inches wide. Stock is about 28. So it really expands the possibilities of what you can sawmill. So specifically on this sawmill, we do dimensional lumber, smaller logs, but a lot of shorter, three foot, four foot, five foot uh, crotch logs, the coffee table, the side table type material. And only because I've cut this like this have I been able to do, uh, do, do that. The other uh, modification, which you can do, you can buy a wood miser like this, but this had a gas motor on it, a 26 horsepower gas motor. This is now a uh, 15 horsepower electric. And uh, it's probably one of the best things I've done to it. Electric versus gas is just, the electric is incredible. I think Matt, you have a 10 horsepower on your mill. Yep. And what's the widest you've cut? Uh, five foot and change. Five foot and change. So I'm doing 42 with 15, yeah. no problem. I've found that actually the power's so nice that you'll lose track of the blade because it will continue cutting flat, but the blade will fatigue and break. So I actually make, I break more blades because we run the blades longer. 
Um, because it has so much power to pull a dull blade through. Pulls the dull blade through, yeah, because it doesn't have that RPM dip, the torque also, right? Where on, you know, you have your knots and your branches. As soon as you have that little RPM dip in a gas motor, that's where you get the wave in the log, and then that's where you change your blade, where, uh, yeah, you can push that, push that dull blade through. So $150, I think, on eBay. Yep, all is cheap. Delivered from Quebec, uh, and it's been fantastic, no complaints. I guess if it stops working, I'm sure I'll find another. <laughs> and then we have the big mill. This is a little bigger. A little bigger, a little bigger. This thing looks a lot different than the last time I was yeah, here. Yeah, Matt was here two years ago, and this was in a trailer uh, just over there. And uh, originally when we got the sawmill, if we see down here, these were the dogs. So this was as wide as it, as it could cut. Uh, everything inside the square frame, everything you see outside of the square frame was inside this square frame. So basically the bandsaw wheels were here and here, and you could cut a log about that big. Uh, what we did, we took it to a local company and we extended the square frame up about, uh, I think we added, we added 12 inches, maybe two feet to the frame. And then in the front here, they have fabricated uh, everything. We use wheels from Cook Sawmill, blade guides from Cook Sawmill. And now basically whatever we can fit between this frame, which is 72 inches, uh, we can cut. And then, as mentioned, the nice thing about the 72 is that when you get 30, 40, 50 inch wide logs, they're very easy to position. Uh, we have adjustable blade guides on it, slide it in and out. So we can do any log, you know, down to 10 inches all the way up to 72, 25 foot long. A little bit more power on this mill. We have a 25 horsepower, uh, and a Baldur actually, Baldur motor. I think one of the, one of the better motors out there. Yeah. Uh, again, eBay special. I think that was $300. Uh, motors are cheap. I'll say it yeah, again. Used motors are cheap. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it guts really well. We use a two inch wide bandsaw blade on it. Um, as I was discussing with Matt earlier though, we have had, been having some issues. On my uh, drive side here, I've actually snapped uh, this shaft twice. This is two and seven sixteenths. So you can imagine the noise it makes. Um, kaboom. kaboom, yeah, yeah, kaboom. It shakes the ground pretty much. Uh, what we did was we improved the steel being used in this. We're not breaking shafts anymore. We've moved on to breaking pillow blocks. So this pillow block literally just blew up uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, it always got warmer than the other one. So we're going to get it replaced next week. And uh, we'll try and see if we can hopefully figure out what's going on there. So if we've got some bearing experts out there, and I'm sure we do, leave a comment below. Let me know. I know you see the triple bearing, and maybe it's an alignment issue. Although I don't believe it is, I have, I've painstakingly check things and recheck things every single time I've put the thing back together and we've actually added a third bearing for sta stability but uh, it could just be what we're trying to do with what we're the parts we're using is, is the issue I don't know but uh, hopefully it, get, it gets working well but she cuts nice and flat a log like this too you can see it's already cut yeah, look at that. we got cut line cut line cut line and basically I'll be able to cut this whole log pull it away with the forklift drop the next one on and we're good to go um, and many people ask us, why can you do that? Is not, not cause stress on the blade. Oh, I get that question a lot. I'm sure you get that question a lot. But when we look at a bandsaw blade, the tooth is bent up, and then the next one's bent down, and the next one's straight. And it repeats that same cycle all the way around the blade. So because of the bend in the teeth, it's cutting a groove that's actually wider than the body of the blade. So there's actually no stress on the body of the blade as it's traveling through the log. The only time I notice an issue is just as we come out of the very back side of the log, I have a two inch wide blade. So you can imagine the teeth are already sticking out and I have whatever, two thirds of the blade still in there. The odd logs that want to have the stress that pull down, will pinch that blade a little bit and we got to listen. And then maybe on those logs, we can only do four or five slabs and we got to slide a couple off. Uh, some slabs, you know, they pop up a little and then it's, it's no problem. You can do the whole log. So I can cut a total of, uh, that's the one difference, I guess, between your mill and my mill, just the way it's designed the that way. The throat depth on this. The throat the, depth, yeah. The full depth of the wheel. 28 inches. You can take advantage of the whole, almost, okay, almost the whole height. Cause almost. Those are 30 yeah, 30 inches, right? inch. You can almost get it So off. he's able to cut it up there because the wheels are mounted so much lower exactly, on yeah. the frame. And that's just the way the, way this one's designed. So we're going to go down now. Let's check out some lumber that this sawmill mills. So check it out. You just saw the sawmill. And uh, now here is a field, basically of uh, slabs. We b generally specialize in the logs 26 inch to about 36 inch diameter. So the book matchable 
um, table stuff, single slab uh, tables even, getting up into the 40, 50 inch wide slabs. The sawmill itself, as I mentioned, can cut 72 inches wide. So we can cut a lot of wood. And really, as Matt actually mentioned recently in uh, one of his posts, even though you have a 72 inch wide sawmill, it just makes it that much easier to position a log 40 inches. You read my posts? I read your posts, Matt. I do follow you, follow along. Uh, <laughs> you seem so surprised. A little bit. That was like a comment. That was a reply to someone else's comment. I know. <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> um, no, the, it, it's, I'm, it's very serious. 72 inch wide sawmill. It just lets you really put on a 40 inch log with a crotch. You, you just kind of drop it on there. You don't have to worry about fitting it in between. So it's real nice. Um, the sawmill has a very wide blade, two inches. So we cut very thin, or very thin, we cut very flat. And uh, we keep everything as a bool. So uh, let me hop on over here. So this is a log, and these are all basically kept right in order. A bool is pretty much a log sliced into in the, any type of board, any type of slab, kept in sequential order. Um, a lot of people will call this a flitch, which it's actually not a flitch. A flitch is actually, it actually is also a flitch. That's wrong. A flitch is four sequential pieces of wood. It can be veneer, it can be a three inch thick slab. So as long as you have four pieces in a row, that would be a flitch. If you have an entire log organized like this, it's a bool. So uh, let's go check out the kiln and I'll show you how I dry these. So this is a uh, vacuum kiln. Completely, um, not a new way of drying wood, but a, uh, uh, it's become economical for somebody like me to own a machine like this. Uh, maybe five, ten years ago, you're looking at a couple million dollars for something like this, and now it's more like fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars. So uh, certainly, uh, it sounds expensive, but if you're drying six thousand board feet in one month through this machine, then it, the numbers do work out. Now, what's different from traditional drying, which I always like to say over dries the outside of the wood, which then forces the moisture on the inside of the wood to come to the outside and basically even out. A vacuum kiln will actually dry the wood from the inside out. So inside this chamber, we load this cart up. I can put 48 inch wide, 48 inch tall wood on here. There's no stickers in between. All the wood is dead stacked. The whole timber cart rolls into the kiln, door closes, draws a vacuum, and we're able to boil water at 38 degrees Celsius instead of 100 degrees. So because of that, the temperatures are actually much lower compared to conventional drying which is a little nicer for the wood. Uh, strong, the, the wood remains stronger, but also the color of the wood is nicer in lighter woods. Um, it has a hydraulic press that once you roll the wood in, you push the button and it pushes six tons of pressure, holding the wood flat while it dries. So uh, it dries from the inside out. It holds it flat with a hydraulic press. Uh, it actually vaporizes water at 38 degrees Celsius instead of 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and then the other, the other uh, uh, I guess, bonus factor of a vacuum kiln is instead of something taking two to three years, we can spend two to three weeks directly off the sawmill, no need for any air drying. And that's uh, applicable to most species. And depending on thicknesses is, is depending on the time frame that you need to be in here. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic machine for somebody like me, a smaller company that can buy a, say, rather expensive walnut log sawmill it and basically deliver dry lumber to my customer in uh, four, six, eight weeks time instead of two, three, four years time. So your, uh, your, your, your return on investment is much quicker, I guess, um, which is all great and dandy. But uh, if the wood wasn't as good quality or better than a DH kiln, I would still do it the old way. The advantage to this is it's not only quicker, the material is much, much better you have a waste factor of 30 to 50% on a, on a standard conventional drying dehumidification. And in this kiln, it's actually under a 1% waste factor. So literally pretty much every single board I put in here, it comes out looking exactly as how I put it in, but dry. And, and that's just like, as a sawmiller, as a guy that dries wood, uh, the, the worst thing that can happen is you put your wood inside a, a room for two months and then you look at it and it looks like this and it's broken in half. And really, you spend, not only that, it's, it's the value of that material. You've had a tree that maybe you saw milled. Matt and I were talking earlier that I actually had a white oak. We actually counted the rings, 257 years old. Uh, 
I don't want to wreck that wood. I feel like the tree has grown that long. Somebody's come along and cut it down. It's now lying in my field. It's on me to be able to produce the best quality wood out of that, uh, out of that tree because really, uh, the, you know, I, I like to respect that tree, I guess, is really the main thing. So um, not only do you have the advantages of the speed, uh, the quality of the material out of this machine is just, just top notch. So we're going to go inside and we're going to check out uh, how the process works a little bit more and I'll explain it. All right, so we showed you the timber cart. The wood rolls in, close the door, uh, we draw the vacuum and we push the button and the hydraulics come down. Uh, right from there, as the vacuum draws down and the wood starts basically boiling inside the, the wood, the, the water is changing to a vapor. Now, uh, during that process, it uses energy in the form of heat, basically. So if you didn't actually add heat to the wood, the reaction would stop. It would basically freeze. So um, we need to add heat into the wood. Now, it's a little bit more difficult in a vacuum because you don't have any oxygen. So it's not like you can just heat the air, which will then heat the wood. So you have different ways of, uh, of heating the wood. Specifically, this one heats it with a uh, microwave. So 6.87 megahertz. Uh, is flowing through the wood. This is a 20,000 watt microwave high frequency generator. So we do all this just to dry wood. And uh, basically what this does, it has a PLC control, a bunch of relays, and inside the back of the box is a transformer and also a high frequency generator. Uh, up above here we have a touch screen. On this screen, we have some dials, and it mostly runs off the temperature. So I have a high and low temperature, and depending on your wood thickness and, uh, and what period you are during the kiln cycle, you can adjust your min and max temperature. You have a min and max on the actual uh, vacuum also, although it's pretty similar for most woods. Um, but it's nice to have this setting because as I come to the end of the cycle, I'll actually raise the vacuum, and it helps equalize the wood. Um, I'm not a super... PhD scientist, so I don't know exactly everything around this, but I have ran it for a year and a half. Most of my loads through this machine is about eight days, 10 days. Uh, we did some three inch white oak, which we had in here for 21 days, uh, three inch thick walnut, and we're talking directly off of a sawmill. No air drying time, uh, walnut uh, about 14 to 17 days in here. And then uh, you can do five quarter walnut, similar to this. We'll dry this a whole load in about six days, um, which is very impressive. And like I said, the qu this has, I think, been a piece that's gone through there. And basically, there's been zero checking, and it stays very, very flat. Uh, so basically, just a whole bunch of settings on here. And this is what adds the heat to the wood. The process is the, w the water inside the wood vaporizes. It actually flows out through the end grain. A vacuum, when the wood is under vacuum, um, it, uh, I guess, extrapolates the feature that out of the end grain, out of a piece of wood, so you have your face grain, uh, the moisture comes out of this end grain, I believe, about 15 times faster in the natural environment. This is why we seal the ends of our logs, because this dries faster and cracks. Um, in a vacuum kiln, the moisture coming out of the end grain moves, I believe it's 2 to 10 million times faster than out of the face grain, which is why we can get, instead of two to three years in drying, we can get two weeks, three weeks to dry a piece of wood. Um, also, the moisture is leaving through the natural pathways of the wood, so it's, it's kind of, um, it keeps the outside faces moist while everything's actually going out the end. So if I stop this load halfway through, I can actually read like 14% here, it'll still be 32% on the end. Completely opposite compared to normal conventional drying which is one reason why the, the wood quality is so good out of it. It's virtually in a steam bath. Uh, and then we actually have other settings on here that we can disable the vacuum, say, every 60 minutes. We can reintroduce the natural atmosphere. All that vapor inside the kiln is going to then condense back on the wood and basically give it a massaging period once every hour. Um, you can set that differently. And um, I was mentioning I've had this for about a year and a half and how quickly the cycles go from either 6 days to 21 days if you really pay attention, you can understand, you can really learn a lot on how to dry wood with a vacuum kiln. I was a complete rookie, complete novice using the machine. It seems very overwhelming, um, but uh, as long as you enjoy it and you, when you want to understand the process, you can really operate one of these very efficiently. You can also wreck wood. I've also, uh, 
Uh, specifically white oak. White oak's very hard to dry, but uh, if you don't operate it correctly, just like any tool, um, you, can, you can really damage some things. But uh, basically this is a big box that puts heat into the wood. The water vaporizes, comes out of the wood, floats around inside of the chamber, and when the vacuum pump engages, will suck out that vapor and separate it uh, from the environment to dry the wood. And you have a whole video on your channel about this too, right? <laughs> I do actually, I do. Uh, recently I posted a video on my own YouTube channel, Canadian Woodworks on YouTube, uh, giving a rundown. This may even actually be a better rundown than that one. Uh, so Matt's got the inside goods here, so don't even worry about my channel. <laughs> so as you see, we have no shortage of logs, so we'll be sawmilling, we'll be drying uh, for the next 500 years, maybe 600. We'll see, uh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, thanks everyone for the tour. You saw my sawmills, you saw the kiln, you learned a little bit of how vacuum drying works. And then uh, you saw a bunch of sliced up lumber. So um, that's who I am. That's legacy lumber. That's what we do. We slice up logs, we dry them. So if you want to follow along on Instagram, uh, at Legacy Lumber, and of course, uh, at Canadian Woodworks, on uh, also <laughs> on Instagram. I'm not good at that one. Oh man. Anything else? That's it. Oh yeah, say happy woodworking. Oh yeah. Thanks for having me, Matt. Happy woodworking. <laughs> that guy. That guy. <laughs>